Welcome to the first video lecture of three on Matthew Quick's young adult novel, Forgive Me, Leonard Peacock. So in this video lecture, I do want to spend a little bit of time addressing the, the surface features of the novel, talking about its plot, uh, character, setting. Uh, but, but primarily, I want to dig deeper into the novel and think about this in terms of its relationship with Shakespeare's tragedy, uh, Hamlet. So I'm really interested in how this particular book speaks backward in time uh, to Hamlet and changes our understanding and how we think about Hamlet, sort of seeing uh, the Hamlet character and the Hamlet story through a 21st century lens. Uh, and then I also want to uh, think about then how Shakespeare speaks forward in time and informs our understanding of this novel, how it informed Matthew Quick's writing of the novel. To that end, in this first video lecture, I want to look at uh, five different characters from the book. Uh, so I want to focus on Leonard's relationship with his mother, uh, Linda, with his father, and then compare those to Hamlet's relationships to his mother and father. Then I want to think about how he uh, interacts with uh, his vice principal, uh, Vice Principal Torres, his English teacher in the play, Mrs. Giovatelli, and also how he, he then um, interacts with his, his best, one of his friends, uh, Babak, the Iranian American who, who plays the violin. All right, so let's scroll down just a little bit here. Uh, one of the things about the, the Kindle version, it doesn't actually include the footnotes on the same page. Uh, so this is an interesting novel, for at least interesting for a young adult novel to do. It includes footnotes, and the footnotes are really interesting. Uh, and in the physical book, in the print book, those footnotes appear on the bottom of the page. So you just quite naturally read them while you're reading through each chapter. Uh, in the Kindle, they put them all at the end, the way you'd expect you know, end notes to work work in a more formal text. Uh, so anyway, you have to click on them to see the, the footnote. But I want to take a look at this footnote. Uh, this is, if you're in this book, the, the footnote appears on page nine. So here's the footnote on his mother. Uh, Linda is my mother. I call her Linda because it annoys her. She says it demoms her. But she demommed herself when she rented an apartment in Manhattan and left me all alone in South Jersey to fend for myself most weeks and increasingly more weekends. Uh, so it's interesting to, to sort of, okay, so that's, that's, that's relationship one. Uh, Leonard and his abandoned, his feelings of abandonment because his mother, who's a fashion designer, goes off to Manhattan to work every week. She's not even back most weekends. Um, so he feels as though his mother has, has abandoned him in some sense. How does that compare with our understanding of Hamlet um, and his feelings that his mother has betrayed him by marrying his uncle, right? All right, so there's that, that's the first one. Scrolling back, if I click here, I can go right back up to where I left off. And then his father. So we want to think Hamlet has an incredibly complex relationship with both his father and also with his, his uncle, who has become his father, uh, Claudius, right? So the same thing. Um, Leonard feels abandoned by his father. So he talks about his, his dirty blonde hair that hangs over my eyes and past my shoulders. I've been growing out for years, ever since the government came after my dad and he fled the country. And so we can scroll and there's the footnote as well on his father. Um, you won't believe this, but my father was actually, you've read the, the footnote already, a minor rock star from the 90s. But, but the key piece is he left. His father is gone. So in the same sense that Hamlet is left alone, his, his Hamlet's father is gone because he was murdered. Uh, Leonard's father is gone because he's been chased off by the IRS and has abandoned him and, and left the country. He's left alone with his mother who he doesn't really uh, trust or feel these connections to. All right, so that, that's our first two. I want to spend a little more time with the others. Uh, let me jump back up here. And then I want to scroll down and I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about... Uh, the ch I want to dig into uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11, where we see, here we are, uh, where we see Leonard interact with his high school vice principal, Vice Principal Torres. Uh, so this is page uh, 36 uh, in the... In the, in the physical book, and it's also page 36 if you're reading from the Kindle version. 
He just looks at me for a second and then says, what's with the hat? So remember at this point, Leonard's wearing his Humphrey Bogart hat. I say, I've been watching bogey films with my neighbor. I've become quite a fan. When he doesn't answer, I say, you know, Humphrey Bogart, here's looking at you, kid. He says, I know who Humphrey Bogart is. Now, back to class. Now, remember, this is, Leonard's supposed to be in class. It's the vice principal's job to try to get him into class. And um, this isn't a normal day for Leonard. It's his 18th birthday, um, but it's also, he's, he's, He's in a very bad place mentally and emotionally right now. And he, and he needs an adult to pay attention to him in a way that he, he can't get. He can't get his mother to pay attention to him. He, his father's gone. So he's looking for these, these father substitutes or parent substitutes. Um, the first one we run across, you know, well, the, not the first one, but the one we're focusing on in this video lecture, Vice Principal Torres. Um, I cross my legs to let him know that I'm not afraid of him and then say, I missed homeroom and haven't checked in yet at the office, so technically I'm on my own time. Haven't punched in, so to speak, boss. Not yet under your jurisdiction. Right now I'm just an everyman in a park. Vice Principal Torres' face starts to turn eggplant purple as he says, I don't have time for double talk this morning, Leonard. So I say, I'm talking pretty effectively, I think. I've answered all of your questions honestly and accurately. I'm always straight with you. But you don't listen. No one listens. Why don't you just sit down? It'll make you feel better. It could really... Leonard, he says, enough. I say, geez, because I was really trying to make a connection. I would have talked with him openly and honestly. No double talk at all. If he would have just sat down, taken a few minutes to be human. All right, so I understand what Leonard's saying here. I, I really do. I, I get that he wants Vice Principal Torres to talk to him Um human to human. But I don't trust Leonard. I don't believe Leonard when he says he would have been honest. Leonard throughout this this novel is an unreliable narrator. There are many points when he tells us something um, which simply are not true. He, his, his perception is not reliable. Uh, and this, I think, is an example of that. He wants the Vice Principal Torres to listen to him, but I think if Vice Principal Torres were to listen to him, I don't really believe this line of, I would have talked to him openly and honestly. Now, that, that's an opinion, uh, but that, that based on after you know having read the novel, thought about Leonard's character, he's not able uh, at this point to express his emotions in a way that can be open and honest. He, he needs to, but he can't. What's so important that he couldn't take five minutes to look up at the sky with me? Oops. Let me scoot this over here. Then Vice Principal Torres does this really lame, unoriginal thing, which depresses me. He probably does this bit with his son, Nathan, whose elementary school picture is on Vice Principal Torres's desk. Vice Principal Torres says, Mr. Peacock, I'm going to count to three. And if you're not on your way to class by the time I say three, you're going to have a big problem. What type of problem am I going to have? He raises in his index finger and says, One, don't you think we should discuss the consequence of my possible inaction so I can decide whether or not doing what you've requested is truly in my best interest? I want to make an informed decision. I want to think. This is school, after all. Aren't you supposed to encourage us to think? Help me out here. He makes a peace sign and says, Two, I look up at the sky smile and then just stand there and, and and stay and then stand just before he says three only because i need to, need to shoot asher beale that's the only reason i swear to god i don't want to make this day any harder than it will already be i'm not afraid of vice principal torres his fingers or his lame ass counting i assure you i start to walk to the office but then i spin around and say i'm worried about you vice principal torres you seem stressed and it's affecting your work he says i've got a full slate today Cut me a break, okay? Will you just go to class, Mr. Peacock? Please? All right, so I think in this scene, I mean, we feel sorry for Leonard. We really do. We have to. Um, he is a sympathetic character who you your heart should go out to him. Um, at the same time, though, I also understand Vice Principal Torres. Vice Principals are always sort of made to be the, the villains in, in, in books like these. And, and Vice Principal Torres, I think it's easy to make him a villain. But I also see this sort of exhaustion in him. And we're going to see the same thing in Mrs. Giovatelli in a moment when we, when we get to chapter um, to chapter 12. And I think that it's it's just worth noting how how tired the adults are in this book. And, and, and it's, yes, they're inadequate. They're not able to meet Leonard's needs. Um, 
but also I don't I, I don't think it's because they're not trying or because they don't want to, but they're part of a system that's overwhelmed, an education system that's overwhelmed. Um, they want to make a difference but can't. So okay, so so think about um, uh, Vice Principal Torres. He kind of becomes this rather shallow, kind of clownish sort of figure who who we can take our our aggression out on, um, who Leonard can take out his aggression on. Um, but I want us to, to think a little bit more deeply than that about him as well. Now let's jump now to chapter 12 and Mrs. Giovatelli. Uh, so Mrs. Giovatelli, let me scroll down here. 9, 10. All right. Here we are. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Um, I want to stop in chapter 11 first and, and take a look at the sunglasses lady. Um, so there's so. So, OK, so we're looking at these different adults that that Leonard interacts with over the course of his day, um, or at least we're looking at some of them. And. The, the, the sunglass lady is an interesting person. So, so Leonard has this, ba this weird habit. I think it's okay to say it's a weird habit where he follows adults on the subway. He gets himself dressed into this suit. He pretends he's a businessman and he follows adults to see how miserable they are. And he's followed one particularly miserable woman who's wearing uh, 1970s style sunglasses. She never gets a name other than the, the 1970s sunglass lady. Uh, and, and he follows her. She realizes he's following her. He, she confronts him. And uh, she ends up stealing his ID. He's a school ID card. And she really, um, she's really hard on him. Um, and, 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 again, and again, just like with Vice Principal Torres, I mean, you've got a, 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 an 18-year-old kid following you around. If you were a woman in her situation, maybe you would be rather mean too if you thought someone was stalking you i mean I, I want to always think about the different characters perspectives in this um i think the book is meant to make her look mean and she is but i also want to understand her point of view too all right uh, and i'm going to actually let me see here i want to scroll down uh well yeah so let's start here uh, so they, they've been meeting in the, the coffee shop she smiled so if you've got it all figured out why follow adults like me like I said before, I was hoping that I'm wrong, that life gets better for some people when they get older. Uh, even the most miserable people, such as you and me, might be able to enjoy at least some aspect of adulthood. Um, she swatted my words out of the air with her hand and said, all ads are lies. Let me move this over here. Life doesn't get better at all. Adulthood is hell. And everything I told you about myself was a lie, too. I made everything up just to see who you were because I thought they paid you to be a spy. Um... And she says, I'm going to keep your ID, and if I ever see you again, I'm pressing charges. She stood up and glared at me through her huge sunglasses. And this is the part that just seems a little over-the-top mean here. Um, she stood up and glared down at me um, through her huge sunglasses, and then she stands up and says, This little prick follows women into dark alleys and asks them intimate questions. He's a true pervert. Do with him as you will, she said loudly to everyone eating breakfast. And then her heels clicked out of the shop. Pow, pow, pow. Uh, I could tell everyone was still looking. Imagine how Leonard feels right now, right? He's having this really impossible. Um, well, this is this is, this is, this had come before. This isn't on his 18th birthday. He's he's having a flashback here, but still, he's going through this really difficult time in his life. Uh, and yes, what he's done is weird. And yes, this adult woman probably should have been nicer to a kid. Uh, he would have been 17 at this point. Um, but wow, yeah. I mean, thinking about just just the the the, uh, the sort of the, the the pain that this would cause someone to be called, you know, to be called out like this and be called this name in this crowded cafe. Uh, and he yells back. He says, "I'm not an effing pervert." I yelled at the people staring at me, although I'm not sure why. The words just shout out of my mouth. I'm not an effing pervert. They all wince. A few people. Oops, let me move this down here. Stuck money under their utensils and left, even though they weren't finished eating. Um, and he ends up being asked to leave, right? So thinking about these relationships with adults in his life, um, uh, this is a, you know, yet another example of an adult that, that, that perhaps could have been better. And I'm not blaming her. I, you know, I, I feel for a woman who's been essentially been stalked uh, and she's angry about it. 
Um, but it was an opportunity where someone could have showed kindness and didn't. Uh, let's let's keep going. Uh, I want to now jump to let's jump now to chapter twelve to Mrs. Giovatelli. Uh, so now we're out of the flashback again, back to Mrs. Giovatella. Uh, we she goes he sits through her English class, which he's late for, and she says, you know, I want to talk to you after class. So we get to the end of class, uh, and she she's talking here. And this, one of the reasons I want to focus on this is because they've just been studying Hamlet in his 12th grade English class. Uh, she says, I graded your Hamlet exam. How do you think I did? How do you think you did? I shrug. Your essay was very interesting. I keep looking at the few clinging leaves that seem to shiver whenever the wind blows. He's staring out the window while, he, while she talks to him. Of course, you completely ignored the prompt. You asked the wrong question, I say. I beg your pardon? No offense, but I think you asked the wrong essay question. She forces an incredulous laugh and says, so you, give, so you gave me the right question? Yes, which was, you read my essay, right? Do you really think Shakespeare is trying to justify suicide? That the entire play is an argument for self-slaughter? Uh, I want to come back to this question. We don't get to see Leonard's actual essay, but we know this much, that he makes the case that Shakespeare in his tragedy Hamlet is trying to justify suicide. That the entire play is an argument, as we see here, for self-slaughter. So I disagree with Leonard. I don't think Hamlet is, is, an, is advocating or justifying suicide or that it's an argument for self-slaughter. So that's, that's my opinion. I, I disagree with Leonard, but I think it does lend insight into his character, if we know Hamlet well enough um, to sort of try to piece together and understand what his essay must have done. Um, she argues, as, as I would, Hamlet doesn't commit suicide. Says, you did read my essay, right? Um, so I think, you know, this is, is a, is a, I don't want to read the whole the whole thing that I've highlighted here, um, but this is key to understanding the connection between Matthew Quick's novel and Hamlet. This is one of the keys to understanding that. And in fact, you know, one of the things I, I think most interesting about Leonard, he can quote whole passages from Hamlet verbatim. He, he in fact, can do it better than Mrs. Giovatelli. Um, and, and and I do not want to be graded on how well I can quote Shakespeare. Um, I, I I can quote some Shakespeare. I can quote a lot of Shakespeare, in fact. Um, but if you were to, to give a reference and I didn't get it, I hope you wouldn't look down upon me. Um, but he does. Um, he, he, I use my acting voice to say, make you a wholesome answer. My wit's disease, but sir, such answers as I can make, you shall command, or rather, as you say, my mother. Therefore, no more, but to the matter. My mother you say. It's a great, great place for Leonard to drop this quotation. It's wonderful. But Mrs. Giovatella doesn't quite get it. Um, for for Leonard, he, he in many ways is Hamlet. Um, he's walking around this novel as Hamlet. And and as he's doing that, and, and, and Mrs. Giovatella's not. I mean, she's teaching Hamlet. She, lo she likes the story, but she doesn't identify with Hamlet to the point where she's memorized these lines and can drop them beautifully into a scene of her or into a moment of her life as though it were a scene on the stage you know and and, and leonard judges her for that in a way that i think is, is really quite cruel uh she has a multiple choice question making imagination it makes me laugh how stupid our ap english teacher is do i wish mrs giovatella knew hamlet a little bit better than she does maybe um is this fair, though, to, to treat her this way, to think about her this way, to talk about her this way? Absolutely not. Um, you see, I was quoting from Hamlet. You did realize that, right? You can't be that much of a shitty teacher. Come on. Wow. Her face goes blank and her mouth becomes an O, like I slapped her hard. Eventually, she stands and walks to her desk. Um, and she's, she starts to cry. Um, you know, he's, he's made her cry here. Uh... And, and, of course, that doesn't help Leonard. He already feels bad about himself. Um, and he's taking his aggression out on, on this woman, his, his, you know, on his teacher. Um, and, and when he realizes that, he, um, you know, here, here there's some, inter you know, let's, let's, let's look here. Um, what makes sad people want to look at that tree? The tree's an interesting symbol. I won't cover it here, but the tree's an interesting symbol that he keeps looking at. Um, her back fat is hanging over her bra strap, and it makes me wonder if she was picked on a lot in high school for being so short, overweight, and squishy. She probably was, which makes me feel even worse. Well, if it makes you feel bad, why do you do it? <laughs> 
why why do we as human beings need to hurt other people because of their physical appearance or because of what they know or don't know? It's, it's just brutal. Um, and, and he he knows it too. Um, and I guess that's what, you know that is what makes him an interesting dynamic character and why we still feel sympathetic for him, um, sympathy toward him. Even though he does things that we don't like or agree with, I mean, he's he's a very much a flawed character, just just like we are. We've all said and done things that we regret. Um, we certainly, pro I, I I imagine, we all have said something to a teacher we wish we wouldn't have said. Um, so many of us actually, you know, we fail to realize our teachers are are human beings with vulnerabilities and weaknesses too. Um, I definitely am always going to stand up for English teachers, right? <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, you know, he says here. Um, you're a good teacher, I say. I knocked my own hat off, too. I'm an asshole, okay? A huge asshole. I don't deserve to have such a fine teacher as yourself, okay? Don't worry about the stupid things I said. I'm sorry I interrupted your class today. My head's not right. It's a half... I, I don't know if it's... I think the apology's genuine, but it sure doesn't sound like the kind of apology that makes things right, either. I, I do think he feels bad. He definitely feels bad about what he said and done in this moment. Uh... I don't deserve to have such a fine teacher as yourself. Sounds sarcastic, though. Um, I know you work hard on your lessons plans, and without facing me, she says, just go, Leonard, please. Are you okay? I'd like you to leave now, she says in a shaky voice. So I do. And, you know, it says in the chapter, you know, he knows that she will, will cry. She, she's crying, and that's why she can't face him more. I think Mrs. Giovatelli kept him after class because she was genuinely worried about him, and she wanted to help. Um, unlike the 70s sunglass lady who, who didn't want to help, um, I think the uh, Vice Principal Torres, Mrs. Giovatella here, they want what's best for Leonard. They want to try to help. Let me scoot this back up here. Um, but they're in a system that's that's overwhelmed. I don't think it's a system that's broken, but it's overwhelmed, and they, they, they can't help Leonard. All right, let's go ahead. I want to look at one more character in today's video lecture. I'm going to come down to my his friend Babak of Iranian descent, uh, and I want to take just a little bit of time with the end of this chapter. So Leonard has is, has these gifts that he's passing out, right? Um, and for uh, for for Babak, he's got. Uh, let's see here. Ah, here we are. Uh, he's got this check. So he has all of the money that was meant for his college fund, and he's writing it, and he's written a check to Babak. Babak doesn't believe the check is, is real or genuine, and he doesn't understand why Leonard is trying to make fun of him or why he's trying to, to give him this fake check. But even Babak says, if there's something wrong for you, you should go to guidance here in this, this first sentence that we're going to look at. Um, uh, and, the, and the check is, is a donation to true democracy in Iran, um, which that is talked about earlier in the book, right? But but I want to talk about I want to zo uh, really zoom in on this 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 very end of the chapter and this idea of first world world problems and third world problems. Uh, maybe you should talk to someone. Babbitt says, like guidance. I tried talking to you, and look where that got us. Listen, you obviously have problems, Leonard. I'm sorry for that. I really am. But there are people with, with worse problems than yours. I can assure you. I can assure you this. Leave this town once in a while and you'll see that I'm right. First world problems, that's what you have. He strides through the doors and I realize I must have really pissed him off because it's the first time he hasn't practiced when the auditorium was available during lunchtime. The first time in three school years. I pick up the check he left behind, sit down in one of those old-ass, creaky seats, and ponder what he said about there being people with worse problems than mine. It takes me all of three seconds to conclude that that's such a bullshit thing to say. Like, the people in Iran are more important than me because their suffering is supposedly more acute. I like thinking all alone in the auditorium, even when there is no violin music. Maybe I never even needed Babak to begin with. Maybe he's just like all the rest. It's better here where I'm by myself. Safer. How do you measure suffering? I mean, the fact that I live in a democratic country doesn't guarantee my life will be problem-free. Far from it. I understand that I'm relatively privileged from a socioeconomical point of view. But so is Hamlet. So are a lot of miserable people. I bet there are people in Iran who are happier than I am, who wish to keep living there regardless of who's in charge politically. Well, I'm miserable here in the supposedly free country and just want out of this life at any cost. So it's all, so again, the reference to Hamlet here. Um, Hamlet lived in a 
uh, had a socioeconomically privileged life, but he was still miserable. Leonard makes the claim he's still miserable. This is a question I want us to come to, back to um, and think about in terms of uh, Leonard's relationship with Babbitt, what that means. He's spent years now listening to him play violin without ever taking the time to get to know him, but listening to his music and, 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 and somehow finding peace within that music, um, but yet still suffering. And I want to ask that. So, so this idea of a first world problem versus third world problems. Um, and whether or not it's okay for Babak to say what you're talking about are first world problems. You're not hungry. You're not in a war zone. Um, I think Babak has a point. I keep playing devil's advocate against Leonard. Like I said, I don't think he's a reliable... He, he's not a reliable narrator. Um, and he doesn't see the world from an unbiased perspective. We start, we're inside his head, and it's valuable to be there. But I do think Babbitt has a point. Uh, Leonard is suffering a great deal, and that suffering is, is valid and genuine, and it's real. And we need to address it and talk about it in this country. Um, mental health issues are real. Uh, suicide is, a, is real. Um, these are not things to be swept under the rug. So I agree with all of that. But then I also agree with the fact that what, what Babak is saying, um, there are things, there are bigger, I don't, big, I, I agree with Leonard in that like, comparing them isn't useful. Um, it's not useful to say my problems are bigger or smaller than yours. That doesn't take us anywhere uh, that, that helps either of us solve those problems. But I do think Babak is right in that even as we suffer, we need to be aware of the suffering of others. And we need to be aware of places um, you know, like, like Babak, be aware of what's going on in Iran, Iraq, the Middle East, what's going on in um, any of a host of places. And, and uh, just, you know, the, whatever, you know, the, we can look into the headlines to find the, the most current place um, geographically that's suffering. We need to be aware of those. And it, it does matter. And it's not okay for those of us in, in the United States who have a privileged socioeconomic background to just ignore that, um, to, to, to ignore the news and to ignore the world around us. Uh, so I see both sides. I, I, I think both of them. And I think this is a, I think the reason, one of the reasons I like this book so well is because it does a wonderful job of um, making us think about these kinds of issues and questions, right? Uh, the kinds of, different kinds of suffering that people have um, and how we can grow as individuals by understanding and talking about these problems. So, all right. Um, I will uh, go ahead and close out the, the first video lecture there uh, and ask you to go ahead and jump into the next chapters and join me again for the, the second video lecture uh, here in just uh, in a bit, a little deeper down in the module. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, enjoy the, the, next, uh, the next chapters of the book.